So wonderful to see all these great entrepreneurs today. Um, my name is Elise King. I'm the program director for Humans in the Wild, which is Human Ventures Venture Studio um, and the way we source about half of our deals. Um, so in terms of Human Ventures, we were founded six years ago with a real belief that the past like 10 to 15 years of venture investing um, was kind of growth at all costs. Um, growth regardless of the cost of employees, stakeholders, the environment, et cetera. And then the future of venture investing was really something that put all stakeholders together and focused on the economy of human needs. Um, so for us, we invest in within the economy of human needs, health and wellness, future of work and community. Um, and that can look like a variety of things. Uh, we are pre-seed and seed stage fund. Um, and kind of similar to Grid 110 within the Venture Studio program where we work with the entrepreneurs, we focus on a lot of similar early stage, um, you know, concepts and ideas that you, I know you all are focusing on in terms of, you know, problem, solution, value prop, that sort of thing as we um, take our companies forward. So that's a little bit about me. Thank you for joining us today. Um, next, we have me too. If you want to introduce yourself and um, what fund you're coming from. Yeah, sure. So my name is Nitu and I'm currently at Alumni Ventures Group and the Pre-Seed and Seed Fund. So a fund inside the fund called Basecamp. I'm a former founder and ex-operator who has worked in operations at Google, but also most more recently as a cross-functional chief of staff. Um, I was a fintech founder and fintech operator. So that's my favorite sector, although we invest sector agnostically. Um, I've been focusing in addition to fintech on B2B SaaS, as well as real estate technology. Um, at AVG, we do everything from pre-seed to seed. And although Alumni Ventures Group is tied to different universities, Basecamp invests globally and isn't tied to any particular university. So we don't care where people have gone to college and we don't care where they're based in the world. Two recent deals I worked on were um, a Nigerian fintech deal, a South African fintech deal, and a Mexican and Central American um, deal as well. Thank you for joining us today. And then we have Caper Capital. Yeah, hi everyone. I'm Batul, I'm an associate at Caper Capital. Um, so I'm originally from LA, but my fund is out in Oakland. Um, and so I've been with KPOR, I'd say since 2019, I started off as a summer associate, was chief of staff for two years and now um, completely on the direct investing side of things. So KPOR Capital is an impact investing firm. We started impact investing in 2011. Um, my fund focuses on investing in early stage companies. So pre-seed, seed and series A, but our sweet spot is seed um, and our thesis this is really investing in companies that are primarily closing gaps of access opportunity or outcome for low-income communities um, and or communities of color. So we're sector agnostic, but we do have a focus on health tech, ed tech, and fintech. Um, and then I specifically focus on companies addressing economic mobility. So that could either come into fintech or um, future of work, for example. And I also focus on the justice tech space. So we also are US only um, and focus on any, mainly on SaaS. So any companies that are using tech to solve um, greater issues. So happy to be here um, and excited for this panel. Thank you for joining us today. Okay, we can jump straight into the questions that we received. So the first question, and we get this question very commonly, but the first question is what makes a pitch stand out? And any of you can answer this one. I guess I, I'll go first. Um, so I think for me also, I mean, I'm seeing a lot of pitches, especially in the very, very early stages. And so I would call a you know, successful pitch one that is succinct and easy to understand. So where I don't have to ask kind of probing questions to get to the bottom of what exactly is the problem that the founder is trying to solve and the solution they are building. So sometimes there are just so many buzzwords or trendy words being thrown out there and there's a lot of fluff in the pitch, which makes the whole thing kind of convoluted um, and hard to understand. 
But at the same time, I would say another thing that I love kind of seeing is just the excitement from founders, right, on what they are building. And so you can't fake passion. Um, so some of my favorite pitches have been those where the founders are just so excited to explain, you know, what they're building, why the why behind it. I love listening to the why. It helps me understand kind of the reason that we're all sitting in the room together or like the virtual room. So. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to go to go next year. Thanks so much for the tool. Um, and I we definitely look for those things as well. And you know, when we're when we are um, taking applications for humans in the wild, we're looking through hundreds of applications. And so it's it really is who can convey the story most quickly. As addition, to, in addition to all the pitches that the deal side's looking through as well. Um, so I think in addition to that, you know, that real passion and founder market market fit, et cetera. Um, really looking for clarity of vision. Um, do you truly understand like problem solution and who who has that problem urgently, consistently is willing to pay for it? Um, so that clarity of vision, both in terms of problem and where you're going, we understand that there will be lots of pivots as a pre-seed and seed stage fund, but like what's the current vision and, and do we buy into that? And then um, one of the, th th this is not my, my genius at all. I'm, I'm stealing this from another investor um, whose name is, he's, um, his name is Manish Patel. He's at Highland Capital. He was like one of the original chief of staffs at Google. <laughs> um, so he's been investing for years. And an advice that he gives our founders is like, what's the secret you know on this market that no one else knows? Which I think is brilliant in terms of like, how are you distinctly seeing this market? Because chances are the investor has already looked at this market before and looked at this problem before. So kind of what new information or way of seeing things or point of view are you bringing? Um, we'd love to look at for that as well. And then last thing I'll add is um, when it's a competitive space, like don't be afraid to hit it dead on um, and say like, I realize this is a competitive space, um, but here's why I think I could win. You don't have to, sometimes I think founders are afraid to address that. Um, again, the investors have seen the market, seen the competitors, they're aware of it. So I would just explain like head on how you're different. Um, I think for me, you know, what gets me excited both in my role at Basecamp, but also just as an investor in general is, you know, the differentiator and like the edge that a particular founder or founding team has. I think like, you know, sometimes there you're looking at an industry or a sector like consumer finance where, you know, there's a lot of cool ideas, but it's a super saturated market and it's hard to establish traction and to show differentiation from the other competitors. And I think that's like a good example of when founder market fit um, is very important. And also like, you know, how, how much you vibe with the founder. And by that, I mean, like, you know, why are they the best people to solve this problem? Why are they the best team to solve this problem? Have they been thinking this through? That's what gets me particularly excited. You know, what I've noticed for pre-seed and seed is like, sure, there might be numbers and there might be a little bit of traction and there might be numericals, but more often than not, there isn't much. Um, you know, they're iterating toward product market fit. They're not there yet. So at that point in time, it's like you're investing in the team and also their coachability and their ability to pivot and find that future product market fit. So that, that's kind of like my viewpoint on it. And there's definitely, of course, you know, as investors, we all have our sector biases. There's definitely some sectors that get me super excited. There's definitely some sectors, you know, like for example, CPG, where I don't know as much and, you know, I might be slightly more wary but um, I do try to cast a wide net and look at everything if, if I like the founder and the team. Those are some very helpful tips. So keep it super simple. Don't need to use any fancy fluffy words and showcase your passion as well. Um, the next question is what is the number one traction benchmark that motivates you to invest in a deal? So what are the, some of the things that you look out for? Um, I, I can go first for this one. And I think like, you know, when they're having indication of network effects, like, and what I mean by that is when you see that the early adopters and users are kind of becoming the salespeople and are promoting the product with their peers, and you're starting to see like, hey, the early users love it so much. They're recommending it to their friends. There's like low churn rate. 
Um, there's a high amount of daily and weekly and monthly active users as well. And just seeing continual growth and trending in the right direction. If it's a super early stage company, like maybe you don't have month over month growth, but you have the week over week growth that is showing like, you know, an upward trend and an upward curve. And I think same for like MRR, right? Like even if it's a really low amount of MRR, just seeing that it's increasing, like, for every, for every month for like the past like three to five months, I think is really important. And, you know, I think those are the metrics. And if they somehow manage to have like a really low burn rate while they're doing all of this, you know, whether that's through having a distributed team or maybe they have like a secret sauce that is letting them, you know, have a low burn rate, that's something that's really important because something I've noticed as an early stage investor is that a lot of companies um, or a lot of founders, you know, get their pre-seed or seed funding. And then they don't calculate how much runway they actually need or, you know, something kicks up like their costs and they're unable to make it to the A because they don't reach the metrics that they need and they run out of money. And I think that's like the post seed death, you know, phenomenon. So I think like, you know, avoiding that by having a low burn rate or having more runway than that, than what's needed gets us excited. Uh Batul, I'm happy to have you go, go go next. I know I was second last time. We can we can we can mix mix it up here. Okay, sure. Yeah, I I actually would second what Neetu is saying. I mean, at Caber Capital, like we are investing at the very early stages, so, and each sector has different benchmarks, right? So there isn't one specific thing that we look for, but we tend to always go back to the customer. So even if you don't have any signed contracts, are you doing your kind of A/B testing, right, in the very beginning stages to find that product market fit? But are there customers that are excited about your product? Um, and and so for us, like we really look at customers and, and one of the things that we like to do as well is like put you in touch with different networks um, and, you know, to even test your product in those circles. Um, and so then, you know, even working before we have uh, kind of put in that check to see like what's working, what's not working. Um, but we, for us, it's really like looking at the customers and are they excited about it? So it's almost, you know, just really seconding what Nithu said. Great. And then for us, um, you, you know, I, I, there's a lot of key metrics we, we, we look at, which I think I'll, I'll, I'll punt down the line. But in terms of like number one stack ranking, it's just what Nitu was talking about previously of founder. Um, you know, at, at the earliest stages, pre-seed seeds, you are betting on this person because like, you know, the product is going to change. You're betting on very little initial traction, that sort of thing. Um, we, especially in Humans in the Wild, we love to work with repeat founders. It doesn't mean you have to have like bought and sold a, 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 or like started and sold a previous company so that you have that entrepreneurial experience and know what it's like to be a founder um, or know what it's like to be in a startup. Um, it, it's such a, a lonely journey sometimes. And I, I know that Grade 110 really focuses on that in, in your community. Um, and so I think we're, we, are, we are betting on the founder um, and what has this person done before and what we've been on them to do again. I love that so much um, because we do talk about this quite a bit at Good 10. And also with things like COVID, um, there's a lot of pivots that can happen to your business, to your company, to your business model. Um, but things that typically don't change are the founder and the things that they're passionate about, um, their experience, the way that they view the world and the problems that they're passionate about solving. Um, so that's definitely very important. Um, we got a specific question about um, companies or startups that are pre-revenue. So what if there's a founder that they're not quite there yet? Are there, are there any other metrics that they can focus on in the meantime? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, to, to jump in here. Um, again, I think as, as everyone on this panel at, at that pre-seed and seed stage, um, we're used to there not being that much product market fit yet. Um, but I think things that we, uh, we are looking for there are, one, are you kind of unafraid to collide with the market? Um, some founders want to get everything perfect and get that MVP perfect and the font perfect and the pictures perfect and everything perfect. And then they put it out in the world. Um, and you really want to be responding to like the key idea or the core idea of what you're putting out in the world. Um, and now you can, you can put out a B product that will, that will suffice for those initial tests. Um, so are you kind of, do you have a bias towards action colliding with the market? 
Um, another thing that we are definitely looking for is that early user engagement. Um, what, what are users doing? What are super users using? Um, even if there's not revenue yet, hopefully there are people using the product. Um, so we'll look for that in kind of those early traction signs. Yeah, I think like, you know, in a case where we typically don't invest if it's pre-product or pre-MVP, but definitely there's been cases where it's pre-revenue. And I think in those situations, like, do they have, um, you know, channel partners and distribution partners? Are they running thought experiments like, you know, on SEO or just on like, you know, little small experiments that show that they're thinking through potential go to market strategies? Um, you know, like how successful have their pilots been? Have they been oversubscribed? Um, what has the feedback been from early users and adopters? Like it doesn't have to be paid, right? But like, you know, what has been the consensus and how quick have they been to incorporate the feedback they've gotten and improve, improve you know, their product? Like if something breaks, how quickly do they um, fix it? And I think speaking to some of their customers, even if it's unpaid or some of their pilot users, can go a long way to show that they're on the right track as well. Yeah, and I guess the last thing just to add is um, something that we really look we really look at, which I, I don't know if it falls under like a key metric or not, um, but it's really like looking at why this could be the solution, right? Like we look for, you know, in five years uh, or so, like can, we, I, or I guess um, a better way to say this is, you know, we want to kind of build the future that we want to see, right? So is this, could this be a solution that, you know, in five years could work for the communities that we care about? And so being very impact focused as we look at all the different solutions out there and see like, you know, even if you're very early and you haven't found product market fit, like why is it that you want to solve this problem and could this be the solution? So for one example I like to give is um, last, or actually this January, we had invested in a pre-seed um, startup in the uh, future of workspace, but more on the people ops technology space. And they had taken a look at, um, so Kpor Capital also is connected to Kpor Foundation. And we do a lot of work on, and a lot of research on why um, folks leave the tech industry. So we did a report, a tech leavers report in 2017. And so that founder actually took the solutions and from that study and, you know, um, did a lot of research just on collecting data from different studies on why women and specifically people of color leave the tech industry to kind of form their solution. And so they did, they were pre-launch, pre-product. Um, but even for us, it was talking through why this solution could work and like taking feedback feedback from us. So are you able to pivot like Nithu said, like, can you take um, advice and feedback from experts um, and be able to pivot um, from your very early kind of idea stage, you know, um, product. And so um, something we look for is just um, for founders themselves, are they able to pivot, but also like, can we kind of build the future together in a way, in a very, um, I would say cheesy way to put it, but. Thank you for that. Um, another question that we got, this is an interesting one, is how can, a, how can a new entrepreneur receive funding with an investor if they don't have the history of networking? So if they don't have access to things like Grid 110 or our panels like these, where would someone start? Anyone? <laughs> Feel free to chime in with your resources or advice? I think like, you know, just looking up what groups or interests that they or their company fall into. So for example, if they're based in Miami and a female founder, there's like organizations for female founders in Miami. There, If it's a fintech startup, there's organizations for fintech startups. If it's, um, you know, if the, pro if the project is involving like workplace SaaS, there's like groups for that. So I think, you know, whether it's um, a demographic group, like, you know, like it could be like a minority resource group. It could be a group for female founders. It could be a group based on like geography, like Midwestern Founders Association, Veterans Founders Association. Also like a lot of alumni organizations have like really cool um, things. Like I know like UT and Texas A&M have stuff for Texas. 
um, you know, like MIT, Berkeley, other schools have stuff for their schools and founders and entrepreneurs from their, um, you know, who have a background going to undergrad or grad school there. So I think those are all options. Um, and, you know, you can find these things on Google, like, you know, it, and you don't need to be intimately connected with them at all. Like, I think if you find one of these organizations, sure, it can be intimidating, but, you know, just sending them a message like, hey, I'm also a founder that fits this requirement and I'm interested in joining. Most of them, I would say all of them, you know, would would respond and be receptive to that. And that's from my own past as a founder. I have friends who have sent messages like that um, and, you know, gotten looped into things. I think another way is if people have access to Clubhouse, um, just attending things on Clubhouse, um, you know, you can choose your interests. Like if you're a founder for a certain vertical or a certain sector, um, there's little clubs on, you know, for like people interested in cybersecurity, for people interested in consumer, creator economy, whatever. And I think that's also a good way to connect with people. And then you can connect offline with Twitter or Instagram to follow up. Um, I would say also on Twitter, like, you know, if you have a profile and you can, you can always go and like DM people and start conversations that way. Getting some sort of calendar app, you know, helped a lot of my friends as well as myself initially, because it can help you organize your meetings. So if you don't have, I don't know which one is best. I mean, I, I use Calendly, but I know that's, you know, some people love it, some people hate it, but any of the apps that you use that can help organize your schedule and help you book meetings with people, I think would be, would be a great place to start. Yeah, I think this is a really pertinent question, especially as, as Juneteenth comes up. I know I'm listening to a lot of different panels tomorrow on this. Um, I actually think there's been a, 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 a nice sea change here in, in the past year. And that you used to hear VCs say, like, the, if you want to get in touch with me, like, find one of my founders and have them intro. Um, and I think many of them, not all of them, but many of them are more conscious of like that creates its own little circle of people and you're only talking to certain people um, that are in the same place or look the same way or that sort of thing. So I do think in the past year, VCs have been more conscious about responding to that cold email um, so that they are opening their own circles more. Um, so you can have you can start with the cold email idea. I love all of Nitu's organizations that she was listing. I also think if you want to take it a step up, um, there's things like on deck or upstream um, where you can do so much VC networking for like free or cheap. Um, and there's really like a lot of VCs on there. Um, so those would be some of my in initial ideas. Yeah, and just kind of seconding, seconding what Elise said there, I feel like there has been a culture shift. So, I mean, even when I had started at Caber Capital in 2019, um, a lot of the work that, you know, even as a summer associate that I did was go through every single submission um, for a prospective company that comes in through our website. So we, we even have like a little disclaimer on there saying like, you don't have to know any one of us, you know, just submit online and we will get back to you. So definitely, you know, now now, you know, two, three years later, I definitely think there are a lot more firms that are open to cold emails, cold calls, things like that. And then I know someone in the chat just put Twitter. There are a lot of events and just, you know, things that are happening that people post on on Twitter. And so even today, so I'm actually in New York. And so there is an event, a fintech like founder investor happy hour. I found that on Twitter. Don't know who the people are, but I'm going to show up. And so half of it is showing up too and like being open to having conversations and networking. Working. And even this panel, for example, like I, you know, I'm open to you all emailing me or, you know, reaching out to me um, and even starting, you know, a conversation. So. That's one of my favorite things about these roundtables is that a lot of the, or I would say almost all of the speakers and investors that we bring in, they, they want to be here, they want to help you, um, you know, they're taking their time, they, they want to learn about you and connect with you. Um, so oftentimes they're, they're excited to learn more about you uh, outside of this roundtable and they share their contact information. So um, please take them up on that and reach out to them afterwards. I'll be sure to share everyone's information.